The following is a Living St. Louis Water Matters special. I'm Jim Kircher, and 25 years ago, in the summer of 1993, I could have not stood on this spot on the St. Louis Riverfront. The Mississippi River would have been over my head, and I mean way over my head. The Great Flood of 93 was no normal seasonal flood. It was unprecedented, not just in the volume of water, but how long that flood lasted. It was record-breaking, and not just here in St. Louis, but throughout much of the heartland. Billions and billions of dollars in damages in cities and towns and farms. There was loss of life, loss of homes, plenty of heartache, and it raised a lot of questions and issues. So we're not going to just talk about the Great Flood of 93, but we're going to talk about what has happened and not happened since then, and in the future, what we should and shouldn't be doing. Because as long as we have rivers, and we have rivers, we're going to have floods. Well, we do have a lot of rivers in this region, big rivers and a lot of tributaries, and at one time or another, they have flooded and many of them will flood again. It's an issue that's sort of easy to ignore when it's not happening. When the water goes down, it's easy to think it's never coming back, but it probably will. And there are people whose job it is to make sure that we do not forget that and that we are prepared for the next time. So I'm joined by some folks who know a lot about rivers and flooding and policy, and also about some of the disagreements about rivers and policy and practices. From St. Charles County, County Executive Steve Elman is joining us. Steve, thanks for coming. Dan Ron is from Pacific, Missouri. He's the city engineer and floodplain manager, so he knows something about this stuff. David Stokes is with the Great Rivers Habitat Alliance. We'll find out what that's all about. And from the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, Don Duncan is joining us. Well, some of us remember the flood of 93, but you know, it's a generation ago now. So before we get into some of the issues, let's go back 25 years. Before the big flood of 93, the satellite view of the Mississippi and Missouri rivers started out looking like this and ended up looking like this. Channel 9 joined a number of other public TV stations up and down the river that year to report on what was happening. In the spring of 1993, in America's Midwest, it rained beautiful soaking rains that drench the heartlands, putting to rest any fears of past drought. Beautiful rains that didn't stop. Throughout the summer, tributaries poured. Scores of rivers surged to flood stage, and all of those rivers surged and poured into the Mississippi, a river too full of too much rain, too much water. We've never had this severe a situation in terms of rainfall. It's an all-time high. So, you know, they talk about a 100-year flood. This is a more than a 100-year flood. Millions of flooded acres, billions in damages, over 30 people killed, and thousands left homeless. I mean, God, we're really getting hit, <laughs> I tell you. The one street that runs along the river is covered and the tourist boats are closed. But the crowds still come to see that being a river city means more than having your fast food on a floating restaurant. You already got all of them? All right, they already got them all. But while the river is an attraction downtown, it is a threat in other parts of the city with different geography. And in some areas, it is destructive. And that brings visitors from Washington. We're gonna, we're gonna talk about it after we make the tour and get a first-hand look. What will you tell the president? We're gonna have a, I just talked with the president uh, personally. We're going to have a strong, effective, coordinated response. People in this neighborhood live along a creek that's backed up by the flooded Mississippi. Norman Leach just got back from his house and he too has learned something about living near a river. I've got probably, um, just in the first floor, I've probably got almost six foot of water. You've lived here since when? 
1980. Did you know going in that this was a possibility someday? No, not really, because of the uh, levee. They, uh, they built it higher than the 73 flood, and that was supposed to be the great flood then, you know. Uh, and even folks that live behind levees have to be aware of the fact that any levee is designed for a specific flood, and even though they have a very high level of protection, there's always a chance, and usually that's a very small chance, that it, that design could in fact be exceeded. You can never 100% eliminate all possible flooding. They've got a wrong reading for St. Charles. It should be 34. So let's not ask if it could happen again. To some extent, it probably can happen again. I'm wondering, and I'll start with you, Steve, because St. Charles County was really hard hit in 93 and gets hard hit on a fairly regular basis by, by flooding. If something like this happened again, um, how would it be different? Would there be more damage, less damage? Are we better prepared? Are we worse prepared? What, what would happen, do you think? There would be less damage, and we're better prepared. Uh, are we as prepared as we could be? Probably not. 43% uh, of St. Charles County is floodplain. Now, after the 93 flood, the federal government came in, and we had a buyout program, and a lot of the uh, a lot of the, the housing in the floodplain was, was, was purchased, uh, it was torn down. Uh, we have a lot of uh, property that was given to us by the federal government which, on which we mow the grass, uh, and there's a lot fewer people living in the floodplain. But there are still people there, and uh, uh, if we have another flood like 93, uh, we, will have, uh, we will have tragedies, we will have a lot of damage. But never, I don't think, as much as in 93. Don, I need to talk to you, because <clears throat> the Army Corps of Engineers, you know, you get this all the time. It's not a natural disaster. It's a man-made disaster. And it's uh, controlling the river and narrowing the channel and building levees, and that's what's causing this. So give me the response to that. I know there's a lot of issues in there, but um, what do you say to those who are saying it's the Army Corps that is at least causing part of the, the, the severity of these these flood issues well after the 93 flood we, we went through the how did this happen phase and several studies were completed after after the flood and one of those looked at did the levees actually cause the flood heights to increase and what we found is that had the levees been there alone yes but the flood the system of flood control reservoirs that we have throughout the upper mississippi basin actually offset any increase that you would have seen due to the levees so the levees actually protected billions of dollars of infrastructure up and down the, the upper Mississippi Valley. So David, I'm gonna bring you in on this. Um, Great Rivers Habitat, Habitat Alliance. Habitat Alliance. What do you guys do and what's your interest in this, uh, this whole process? This is a pretty new, I mean, compared to what, 2000 is when the organization was started? Correct, and, and our interest is in preserving the, the floodplain, in preserving floodplain and wetlands in its natural state particularly on the area of, of the confluence of all the great rivers in this area. And, and we oppose the significant floodplain development that we consistently see over and over. We saw it before the great flood of 93, and we see it constantly after the great flood of 93, as Chesterfield Valley being the number one example, an area that was underwater by, by uh, the entire area was underwater, and now it's primarily paved over and commercially developed. And we're seeing similar things happening in Maryland Heights and many other cities in this region. So I think St. Louis County, if the flood of 93 were to happen again, when it happens again, I think St. Louis County will be in, in worse shape for it because we've paved over and developed so much of our floodplain. Now let's talk a little bit more about Chesterfield Valley. Um, used to be called Gumbo Flats, now it's a major uh, economic engine uh, for Chesterfield and we don't have anybody from Chesterfield here but let's talk about that process of how um, we go and maybe Steve you, you you know this because you get the same issues in St. Charles County um, that you want a good economy you want a solid growing economy in St. Charles and people want to build in places that maybe you think is not a good place to build I think uh, historians will look back and wonder how it was that only three years after the 93 flood we were talking about building this giant levee in Chesterfield. I was there in 96 and testified against it at a Corps of Engineers hearing, uh, questioned the colonel at the time, and of course his position was this is not going to impact St. Charles County, it's only going to create a one-foot rise. 
Well, that's how our system is set up. So the, in the, if you're out of the floodway and the entire floodway were to be levied, it would only create a one foot rise. So it's like, relax, don't worry about it. Well, 16 years later, uh, the Corps came back, oh yeah, we've got a new map now. And the 100 year flood level raised two feet on the Missouri River across from those levees at St. Charles. So my question is 16 years from now, are we gonna have another map where it's four foot higher? Uh, the whole system was based upon certain engineering predictions that have not come true and I'll you know, invite Don to yeah. challenge We've that got some likes. great footage by the way of the Chesterfield Valley uh, flooding because uh, a lot of people don't remember. They, they know Chesterfield Valley now and what it looks like. Uh, they don't necessarily know what it was like back then. And that was a, um, the levee was breached. It wasn't topped, it, it broke through. But let's talk about the, um, what, what Steve was talking about. So, so there's a couple of points to be made. One is that Chesterfield Valley had a 100 year certified levee prior to the flood of 93. The levee today is much taller and much more robust than it was at that time. And when you say robust, I mean, part of this is it's, it's stronger. It was built to be stronger? Yes, so there's, there's a couple different components to levee design. One is how tall is it? Right. And then how wide is it? But the part that people don't see and don't think about is that water can actually pass through the ground under a levee. And a lot of times that's what causes a levee to fail. It's not the water going over the top, it's the water going underneath or under seepage. So but the new design of the levee incorporates the latest engineering technology to offset any of those under seepage pressures to try to eliminate or redu greatly reduce the possibility of an under seepage failure. So really it's an infrastructure uh, issue as well as a, I mean, it's, we, we got a lot of levees uh, in, in, this, in this region. And, and Dan, I wanna talk to you because you're, you're coming out of Pacific. Um, the, some of the big, biggest issues and questions have come out of the recent flooding uh, on the Merrimack River. That's two big floods in just a year and a half. That Pacific, Valley Park, Eureka, all of those places going up to Arnold we're facing. Uh, what, what kind of issues are, are you guys? And you're a small town. Mm -hmm. you're, you're really fighting for survival. Right, right. Yeah, and, and we did 2015 and 2017. Uh, 18 months later, we had two historic events. So, uh, you know, some of the biggest issues that we're facing now are people that live in the floodplain, um, you know, we're, we're in the process of applying for buyouts, um, just like St. Charles County did, but that affects such a big part of our population in Pacific and other small towns that um, there's some economic uh, issues there that, you know, y if you take away half your city, then what happens to your your, your real estate taxes and your sales taxes? And yeah, like it would seem to me, I think to some extent, you know, if you're in a big city, uh, you buy out some folks, they're going to they're gonna move uh, up the hill or down the road. You, 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 you might lose people and businesses that never come back. And that, that's, for a small town, that's, that's a huge impact. Right, and that's, that's what we're facing now. And, and, you know, I don't know that there's a, a perfect answer to that, but there are um, some flood mitigation grant programs that, that, that help with um, different infrastructure projects, things like that. But... Um, losing those people is difficult. So help me out here. Let's talk about, I know we, 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 we're hearing now about um, gray and green, right, responses to this. We're building things. We can build flood walls and levees. Let's talk, at David, about the, the, the green responses. And I think it's not just the environmentalists who are talking about this anymore. I think it's the cities of Pacific and Grafton and other places that are, are looking at uh, non-structural, let's say, solutions to this. What are you seeing in, in terms of that? Well, in, in terms of public policy, what we need most of all in Missouri, and the core is not opposed to this, but we need the cities and counties in this state to have tougher floodplain development rules. We need them to, to lower the, the amount of, of rise that can be done with floodplain developments, as County Executive Ailman said. If you're out of the floodway but in the floodplain, you can still build all, all you want up there as long as you can demonstrate it's only going to increase the flood height in the area by one foot. Well, if you get a whole lot of developments in a region all increasing the flood height by a foot, you see exactly what we have where FEMA comes out with the maps and all of a sudden 
the, the flood heights are dramatically increased throughout a whole region. So the, simple, the single most important long-term thing we need for this region is for cities and counties to enact tougher floodplain development rules. And that's where the fragmented nature of government in St. Louis comes into play because so many cities, Chesterfield, Maryland Heights, so we can name two dozen more, are really more concerned about what's good for them, what's good for their city, where, where are they gonna get those sales tax dollars? And they're less concerned about what's good for the entire region. So that's, that's the main change we need to make from a policy perspective. As I read it, go ahead. Yeah, Don, aren't we really talking about cumulative effect here? Uh, and this is my understanding is that a lot of time a project when it's looked at by itself uh, seems to be a good project uh, but when you look at all the various project and the cumulative effect that they have on the river uh, that's the problem isn't it that's that's part of it also we're seeing much more intense rainfall events uh, lately than we've seen in the past um, a lot of it is uh, you know knowing your flood risk in, in the Merrimack Basin the, the maps for FEMA were finalized in 1982. Well, guess what? Our flood of record happened in 1982, and those maps hadn't been up, updated since. So people didn't know their flood risk. But if you would redo, if you would have redone the statistics after the flood of 1982 and redone that mapping, you would have seen maps that look very similar to what had flooded in 15 and 16. So people would have known they were in the floodplain and would have known would have had to have purchased flood insurance or at least been aware that they, they probably should buy flood insurance. So what's the purpose of having a, a program if the maps are outdated? Well, it's very expensive to update maps. It takes a lot of time. Uh, the FEMA had actually started the process right before the 15 flood. And it, it, it'll be in the next year or so when those maps are finally effective for Jefferson County. So it, it takes several years. It's a very public process, very transparent, so people have time to comment on on the maps if they know something's awry with them. Uh, it, you know, things take time in the government to, to work through a process and, and get public comment and revise and, I've and noticed. before things are, are made final. <laughs> so, now, How many people, this is, this is a question, I'm reading up on this, I'm thinking, who's in charge of this? We have federal, we have the U.S. Army Corps, we've got FEMA, we've got states, we've got municipalities like Pacific, we've got landowners, and we've got levy districts. Is this one of the issues, is that n these people are working or these organizations are not necessarily working together but working in their own interests? Well, the good thing that, that happened here is the federal government didn't create an entirely new bureaucracy to police the floodplains. What they did is create a, a system of rules and regulations in each jurisdiction, whether it's a county, a city, uh, if they want to have flood insurance for their uh, people, they have to abide by these rules and they have to enforce these rules. So what we have basically is uh, the federal government taking over land use decisions on a grand scale, but at least being smart enough to leave the enforcement to the locals rather than creating another new, entirely new bureaucracy. Now the, the existing bureaucracies at the Corps of Engineers are there to help people know what's going to happen, what can and can't be done. But see the um, we mentioned this whole floodway issue, and that's the problem in St. Charles County. Back in, back in the uh, late 70s, uh, the, the leadership in St. Charles County agreed to a, a map in which the floodway was drawn in such a way that all of the existing levees in St. Louis County were out of the floodway, including the Chesterfield Monarch levee. And all the existing levees in St. Charles County were in the floodway. What that meant is if it, you're going to raise levees in St. Charles County, you had to start from scratch. You had to move them back as opposed to St. Louis County, where as in Chesterfield, you just made them higher, you made them bigger. Now, as a result of that, and, and our levees are basically agricultural levees, uh, it's, it's one thing for, for a commercial interest to hire the engineers and do the things that need to be done to get the permits. My experience in St. Charles County is that this, this whole entire system basically put farmers at a disadvantage. Yeah, I want to remind people, too, that in the flood of 93, we tend to look at the cities because it's the most dramatic footage. But a lot of the losses in 93 were agricultural losses and not, not uh, physical towns and homes. And those are the one people who really need to be in the floodplain. Uh, right. If, 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 if they're at least in the confluence in St. Charles County. Uh, the other folks, you know, could move up on the hill if they had to, but uh, 
in a large floodplain like we have, which is basically two floodplains, Mississippi and Missouri, you're going to have to have some people continue to live there. Yeah, and that, that land should be there, and that land should be then protected from disaster through insurance purposes. But what we've done, and in St. Charles County they've taken the lead in trying to oppose this, but what we've done is we've used, it's not just that we're developing the floodplain throughout the re region, but we're subsidizing it constantly. Mm -hmm. And if nothing else, we need to remove those subsidies so that you don't have general taxpayers paying a significant amount of the developments in Chesterfield and Maryland Heights. And similar to that at the National Flood Insurance Program, if people actually had to pay for the full freight of their insurance instead of being subsidized by general taxpayers, you'd have less floodplain development. Steve, I think mm -hmm. you wrote, and I don't know if it still applies today, that there was a system designed to have fewer people in the floodplain and fewer damages, but what you've resulted in is more people and more damages. Yeah, in St. Charles County on Alton Lake, which was built, uh, was the result of uh, Alton Dam built in the 1930s, you had a lot of people, uh, including families I remember as kids, who went down there and built clubhouses along the, the lake. They used uh, leftover timbers and product and whatever, and every time there'd be a flood, you'd have to go back and fix it. Well, then the flood insurance came along. Now, you can, th that, that those clubhouses became low-income housing, in effect, because now you could afford to go ahead and invest some money in them, because when the flood came, you were going to get a check from the government. So it had just the opposite uh, effect that was intended. Instead of discouraging floodplain development, it actually encouraged more people to live in the floodplain permanently. Yeah, and to, 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 com to put that together with your question, you know, we have, it puts a lot of pressure on local jurisdictions to regulate development because they're, you know, the National Flood Insurance Program does create a bit of an incentive um, to develop property and then the, the onus of, of the floodplain management, development management is on the local governments who, you know, would like to see economic development. Yeah, so and that's always the trade-off. So just a little bit of history, you guys might know this, in the flood of 1785, not 1993, but 1785, the town of St. Genevieve had to move off of its original location on the Mississippi River uphill a little bit to where it is today. After the flood of 90, 1993, that was the story of Valmire, Illinois, overcome by the Mississippi River floodwaters. It had to rebuild, actually build a whole new town higher up on the bluff. Ruthie Zell went there to see how things are going 25 years later. Here in Valmire, Illinois, there's an entire generation of residents for whom this is the only Valmire that's ever existed. But for those who lived through the flood, it's been quite a journey from devastation to rebirth. Soon we'll see some more activity here. Few people recall the history of what happened to old Valmire, like village administrator Dennis Knobloch. He was in his second term as Valmire's mayor when he issued a mandatory evacuation ahead of the first floodwaters that arrived Monday morning, August 2nd, 1993. We had anywhere from, if you lived on the good side of town, on the east side of town, few houses stayed completely dry. Um, but then the water levels increased, maybe a foot or two of water there, up to 16 feet on the west side of town. It wasn't as much the depth of the water as it was the current. So we had strong current, we had floating debris, uh, trees, small buildings, tractor tires, anything that the water could pick up and float along, that was all coming through and smashing into the houses and causing damage and things like that. So we knew with the amount of damage that we had to the number of properties that were damaged and with the attitude of the people, we knew that a lot of folks would be going different directions and there probably wouldn't be a town anymore. In just a few months, Mayor Knobloch had a preliminary plan and secured a new location for the village 400 feet higher on nearby farmland. With funding from the state and federal governments, the community broke ground in December of 93 for the new Valmire. The federal government bought out the owners of about 325 flood-ravaged homes, then turned the land over to the village of Valmire, which was responsible for demolition. 
Rather than rebuild homes on this land, the village is leasing it to area farmers. They, in turn, are growing soybeans on it. Another, more creative example of repurposing can be found on higher ground. Rock City is an underground commercial development in an abandoned limestone quarry. The quarry's caves, with their naturally cool temperatures, are ideal for warehousing and distribution and refrigerated storage. Val Meyer acquired the quarry as part of its purchase of farmland for the new village. It's leasing the property to the developer. As Val Meyer rebuilds its business space, it initially lost about 30. The village is also rebuilding population. Its 1993 total of 900 residents dropped more than 20 percent. A quarter century later, that figure is up to nearly 1,300. We had our high school baseball team here that picked up second place in state, which is phenomenal for a town this size. And, uh, you know, had we not gone through the effort to rebuild and relocate the town and keep it together, we wouldn't be experiencing things like that now and, and having things like that for the, the next generation to enjoy. So whether it's a town, an individual, or a homeowner, it is a long road back from floods. I want to thank you guys for joining us. We had a lot more to talk about, but uh, I hope we don't have a reason to talk about it at least any time soon. Uh, Steve Elman from St. Charles County. Dan Ron from Pacific, Missouri, David Stokes from the Great Rivers Habitat Alliance, and Don Duncan from the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. Guys, thanks for joining us. I'm Jim Kircher. We'll see you next time.